So the organizers of this Daria conference invited me to talk today about scholarly primitives. What methods do humanities researchers have in common and how might our tools reflect this? That's the long title of an essay I self-published on the web, open access in the year 2000, 20 years ago. This is my most frequently cited article, according to Google Scholar. It was developed first as a paper uh, for a King's College London symposium in May of 2000. That was a one day symposium on humanities computing, formal methods, experimental practice that included Hasak Chang, uh, then at University College London, uh, Harry Collins, Cardiff University, uh, my colleague Jerome McGann from UVA, uh, Tito Orlandi from Sapienza University of Rome, and me. The Daria invitation has prompted me to recollect and reconstruct a sequence of events that followed from that symposium through a variety of grant funded projects and other collaborations leading in a more or less unbroken chain up to the present. So I want to apologize in advance for delivering a paper that will from time to time foreground its author, but that's the 20th anniversary dilemma. Uh, from time to time, I will also note when in relation to the publication of scholarly primitives, some advance in web technologies or standards took place. I hasten to say that's not meant to suggest causality, only to explain what did and didn't exist in the world in which I wrote that essay 20 years ago. Along the way though, I hope my account of the last 20 years will make it clear that universities have been an aquifer of creativity clarity and expertise in learning how to think collectively online. But I would also want to point out that the, there's a crucial role for capital investment in doing things at scale, whether that investment comes from commercial entities like Google or governments like China or collections of nation states like the European Union. When we look back over the last 20 years, as we'll be doing here today, we'll see a mix of contributions from all of these players. So I wanna be sure at the outset to say in the translated words of Marx, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Universities, nonprofits, commercial entities, standards organizations, telecommunications companies, governments, et cetera, et cetera, all have something to contribute and they all need something in return. Scholarship is no different. Those who study the cultural record and its transmission across time and space have a great deal to offer those trying to build an infrastructure that permits reliable and stable reference, the association of ancillary with actionable information and so on. In return, scholars need an operating environment that respects and embodies the scholarship's foundational sources and methods. And by the same token, if we're to be ever more desperately engaged in a search for truth in the hall of deep fake mirrors, then I think a generalized information infrastructure that supports scholarly primitives will be more important than ever in the future and not less so. So let's begin at the beginning with the symposium paper in question. Rereading scholarly primitives 20 years later, I have to say, I think it's pretty badly done. It begins by listing seven proposed primitives, discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing. It barely discusses three of them, referring, illustrating, and representing. It also fails to explain the difference between illustrating and representing, which might've been interesting. And it's not really clear on whether these primitives are things that should be found bundled into software tools or as components to be variously combined in research environments or in some other form. I think the original author of this piece meant it as a critique of the shortcomings of the World Wide Web some seven years in if we count 1993 as the public beginning of the web with the introduction of Mosaic by the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. 1993 was also when I began as director of the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities at the University of Virginia, where I bet on the web as the scholars workbench, rather than a more functional, less populous implementation of hypertext that we might've built in-house. That was a conscious choice and it still seems to me the correct one, our colleagues at Illinois and also importantly at Brown University built the systems and helped to develop the standards that demonstrated you could really create the web environment, which is what the World Wide Web and early HTML both were at different levels of, in the stack. And perhaps that helps to explain why this 20 year old essay of mine was built out of remnants from two failed grant proposals about which more in just a moment. Still the piece clearly resonated with readers in the digital humanities and it continues to do so. But I should say that the support for the fundamentals of network 
scholarship on the open web today is actually better than it was 20 years ago. It's far from perfect, but it is a lot better. Um, and I have some belated citations here. My 2000 symposium paper doesn't properly acknowledge its debt to some UK digital humanities colleagues, and I'd like to take this opportunity to rectify that. I note in the original, uh, in the text of the original piece that I'm drawing on ideas from an unsuccessful NEH proposal from several of us at the Institute for Advanced Technology and the Humanities in July of 1999, a proposal called Text Analysis for the Digital Library. Though I don't mention it in scholarly primitives, that proposal in turn drew heavily on an earlier proposal with the same title, also unsuccessful, that was developed in 1998 for an NSF JISC funding opportunity. The NSF JISC proposal included a large group of participants, Steve DeRose and Ellie Millenis from Brown, Tom Horton, now at UVA, then at Florida Atlantic, Worthy Martin, Daniel Pitty, David Seaman, and myself from UVA, Chris Brew and Henry Thompson from Edinburgh, Harold Short, John Bradley, and John Labignino from King's College London, and Lou Bernard and Mike Popham from Oxford University. Willard McCarty, the editor of the Humanist Mailing List, was also at King's College at the time. And you can hear ideas from our 1998 conversation echoing in Humanist in a January 19th, 1999 post by Willard, where he says, from my training as a literary critic, I would say that a fundamental problem squarely in our court is to determine the mechanical primitives of textual analysis so that, for example, better text analysis software can be written, though that's only one reason for tackling the problem. Willard goes on to suggest that we might imagine primitives beyond the ones we now have that would help literary critical analysis along. This would begin with those existing primitives to ask where the deficiencies lie. What do our colleagues want to do that they cannot now do with the computer? Again, the survey might be useful to deal with the dissatisfactions, collect the wish lists and actually examine them analytically. Then on the way to imagining the new, we might consider bridging efforts to bring into the fold of the approachable, those techniques that in fact currently exist, but are inaccessible for one reason or another." End of quote. The idea of primitives is not original to Willard any more than it is to me. And in fact, he cites a close friend and colleague visiting me recently here in London as having suggested indirectly that one good way of, in, of understanding what our field is would be to identify the basic scholarly problems with which it is engaged or should engage. Perhaps that was another symposium participant. I don't think I was Willard's mystery guest. In any case, the word primitives does not appear on our NSF JISC proposal. Well, it does appear in my summer 1999 NEH proposal as functional primitives. And in between those two proposals, the term appears in the context of text analysis in that humanist post by Willard as mechanical primitives. Our thinking in the NEH proposal was really focused on text, and though we gestured at the applicability of these primitives for research with other data types. Looking back on it now, we were clearly hoping to expand on software we had built to facilitate the comparison of related texts in different languages for religion professor Michael Satlow's IATH project on the multilingual record of stories about Ab Adam and Eve, a project that was our first foray into Unicode in a piece of Unicode, custom Unicode software we called Babel. So in my own thinking and experience, comparison was probably the original primitive. In the NEH proposal, I wrote, comparison is one of the most basic scholarly operations, a functional primitive of humanities research, as it were. Scholars in many different disciplines, working with many different kinds of material, want to compare several, sometimes many, objects of analysis whether those objects are texts, images, films, or any other species of human production. A second functional primitive is, in our view, selection. Not only the selection of objects for comparison, but also an equally important, the selection of regions of interest within the objects selected. A third functional primitive is linking, either in the classic form of annotation or in the more abstract sense of creating operative associations between, among, and within digital objects." Unquote. So mechanical primitives became functional primitives, became scholarly primitives, and the last one stuck. I would argue that's because, it, because it's the most figurative phrase. The primitives themselves are not scholarly. Primitives of scholarship would have been more literally, literally co correct. My figure of speech asks us to consider what are the irreducible building blocks of scholarship. And that was, and I think remains an interesting question. 
In any case, the argument of my symposium paper in 2000 was that the web didn't support the basic functions of scholarship very well, if at all. And to some extent that remains true today with some notable exceptions, which I will discuss in a bit. Meanwhile, and in spite of two failed grant proposals, I continued to think that what digital scholarship needed was better soft. A few years later in 2003 in Washington, DC, I delivered a talk called Tool Time, or Haven't We Been Here Already? In which I reviewed the previous decades, many instances of digital humanists calling for better tools for text analysis. In that paper, I looked back to a humanist post written 10 years earlier in 1993 by Nancy Ide, in which she said, commercial software for text analysis and manipulation covers only a fraction of research needs. And it is often expensive and hard to adapt or extend to fit a particular research problem. Software developed by individual researchers and labs is often experimental and hard to get, hard to install, underdocumented, and sometimes unreliable. Above all, most of this software is incompatible. As a result, it is not at all uncommon for researchers to develop tailor-made systems that replicate much of the functionality of other systems and in turn create prog programs that cannot be reused by others, and so on, in an endless software waste cycle. The reusability of data is a much discussed, discussed topic these days. Similarly, we need software reusability to avoid reinventing the wheel that's characteristic of much language analytic research in the past three decades." <clears throat> End quote. In tool time, I noted that some real headway had been made on these problems in the computational linguistics community through projects like GATE, the General Architecture for Text Engineering. But I argued that there was still work to do on the broader analysis of cultural data. And by the way, this is how software waste cycles begin. You come to understand that a problem exists and if you travel and read a bit, you may learn that a neighboring community of researchers is also aware of this problem. They may even have produced some solutions. However, the most obvious feature of your intellectual neighbor's solution to your shared problem is likely to be the fact that it doesn't go at it from your point of view. So a proposal will be written to start finding solutions from that point of view, too often from scratch. And those proposals may even be funded. What eventually emerged from tool time the talk was yet another grant proposal, this time to Mellon, for my first text mining project called NORA, an acronym for no one remembers acronyms. Uh, NORA in 2004 set about developing an environment for literary text analysis in a collaboration that involved the late great Stefan Sinclair and others from McMaster, Tom Horton and others from UVA, Matt Kirschenbaum and Martha Nell Smith and others from the University of Maryland, Stan Rucker and others from the University of Alberta, and Steve Ramsey, first at Georgia and then at Nebraska, and me and some others at the University of Illinois, where I was at that point uh, Dean of the Library School. By this time, it was clear for me, at least, that scholarly primitives were analytical routines for text analysis and text mining that could be combined together in various workflows inside a workbench environment, not unlike GATE, but maybe with a bit more user interface. In 2007, NORA became MONK, another acronym standing for Metadata Offer New Knowledge, another Mellon funded project that included some of NORA's participants, plus Martin Mueller and others at Northwestern University. MONK actually did eventually for a while persist as a library service operated at the University of Illinois. And it brought together 150 million words of literary text from the beginning of the age of print to the beginning of the dark age of copyright in a variety of literary genres. These texts came from a number of different sources. And one of the major accomplishments of this project was something called Abbott, developed by Brian Pitlick-Zillig, Steve Ramsey, and Martin Mueller. Abbott, uh, which you can still find out there on the web at monkproject.org, uh, learned XML schema and with a little help from humans produced style sheets that could be used to bring a number of variant schema into one normalized schema. I didn't think that would be possible. And that marks one of a number of times when I've been wrong in saying something's not possible. Another accomplishment from this phase of the work was Morphodorner by Phil Burns at Northwestern. Morphodorner is a trainable part of speech tagger. Trainable is important because as some of you will surely know, if you use part of speech taggers developed on the basis of contemporary news corpora, for example, to tag early modern literary texts, you get lousy results. But if you train your tagger on pre-modern texts, you get much better results. 
Morph Adorner eventually became its own Mellon funded project and along the way advanced some of Martin Mueller's work on TEIA, a restricted TEI tag set meant for linguistic annotation. Monk, the project led at the University of Illinois, was in turn followed in 2009 by another Mellon funded project called Caesar Services, uh, which brought together Loretta Alvel, Boris Capitano, and others from the National Center for Supercomputing with the Monk project. Caesar stood for Software Environment for the Advancement of Scholarly Research, and it built on previous NCS, uh, NCSA work in a project called D2K or Data to Knowledge a data mining environment for all kinds of data mining, including GIS, audio, and other widely divergent data types. The project mined the Monk database of text, but it used D2K and Caesar tools for the workbench itself. All of the phases of Nora, Monk, and Caesar were funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. The outcome of this work in my own career was twofold. First, it led me to propose the Hathi Trust Research Center, uh, also known as HTRC, which was subsequently funded by Hathi Trust in 2011 and in some facets has been funded by Mellon as well. HTRC currently operates text mining services that have their roots in Monk, though by now generations of new ideas and implementation also separate HTRC from Monk. Most recently, my interest in a reusable infrastructure for text analysis has taken the form of an advisory engagement with JSTOR's nascent text mining platform. The UVA Library and the UVA School of Data Science will jointly host one of two NEH summer seminars and text mining with JSTOR infrastructure this coming summer. Uh, now back to that badly done symposium paper delivered at King's College in 2000 with an eye to what's changed in the last 20 years. In the original essay, I claimed that the most interesting things that you can do with standalone tools and standalone resources is less interesting and less important than the least interesting thing you can do with networked tools and networked resources. That's the sort of provocation I used to toss off in essays like what is humanities computing and what is not. I'm less inclined to provocation as a rhetorical strategy these days, but what I meant in 2000 was that the web brought to digital humanities the multiplier of scholarly networking and immediate communication that was missing in both standalone tools and traditional print scholarship. I went on to say that, quote, in the world of the web, the most prominent tool for discovery is the search engine, unquote. In 2000, it felt like web search engines were springing up everywhere. Sure, Google launched in 1998, but it was only the latest in a long series of network search tools on a timeline that stretches back in some ways to who is in the 1980s, a search engine to find domains still in use, through Archie in 1990 for searching file names on public FTP sites, to Gopher in 1991, which offered the first links to documents listed in hierarchical menus, and many other pre-Google discovery tools now forgotten. For example, just from 1993, OlliWeb by Martin Kruster, which required website administrators to notify the search engine of the existence of materials to be indexed, but also Jump Station by Jonathan Fletcher, the first World Wide Web search engine to combine crawling, indexing, and searching. Yahoo tried the directory approach starting in 1993, followed in 1994 by Lycos, which originated at Carnegie Mellon. Lycos combined a search engine with a web portal, and Lycos was also the first publicly traded search engine. Both of these still exist in some form today. And all of this history is thanks to Wikipedia, by the way. A web crawler from the University of Washington appeared in 1994, and it was the first network search engine of any kind to allow users to search any word in any indexed document. AltaVista came along in 1995 and allowed natural language queries. It's long since been bought and digested into Yahoo. In 1996, Brewster Kale launched the Internet Archive, which archived copies of web pages day after day, another thing that I thought was impossible, and made the past of the web searchable. Ask Jeeves answered the door in 1997, ranking links by popularity. MSN Search from Inktomi via Microsoft launched in 1998, as did Google. And in 2000, when I first delivered scholarly primitives, Baidu was launched and has since become the Chinese Google and then some. So in 2000, discovery was a very big deal and the landscape was far from settled. To put all, that, put all that history into a smaller frame, in 2000, we'd been able to search for specific words or phrases in web pages for just a little more than five years. 2000 was also the very peak of the dot-com bubble in which stock speculation on internet companies like Lycos drove prices to unfounded heights from which the market 
retreated precipitously a couple of years later. In these heady days though, it really did seem as though internet search and particularly the ability to search and discover full text was changing everything. In the year 2000, here are some things that didn't exist. Uh, Wikipedia, which appeared in 2001, Google Books appeared in 2004, and Hathi Trust, which appeared in 2008. Each of these plays into discovery in different ways. Wikipedia is a massive crowdsourced reference work on many topics, it's also among the first search results. It has no real competitors in its medium. Google Books and Hathi Trust are related efforts to convert massive amounts of print to digital form by mining the monograph collections of university libraries. Participating libraries wisely required Google to return to them a digitized copy of the books from their collections that became part of Google Books. And after a few years of organizing, universities formed Hathi Trust, not only for Google Books materials, but also for materials scanned in partnership with the Internet Archive and materials scanned by libraries themselves. Libraries that are members of Hathi Trust can integrate into their catalogs links to Hathi's digital copies of the library's print holdings, and library users can search full text of both public domain and copyrighted materials and download full text of the public domain materials if they like. Google Books is no longer the front burner project it once was at Google, but Hathi Trust and its research center continue to grow and develop in interesting and important ways. Most recently demonstrated in Hathi Trust's emergency text access service in which copyrighted materials held in a library's physical collections are being made available in digitized form to one user at a time. Both Hathi Trust and the Internet Archive tackle copyright as an obstacle to discovery, though they do so in different ways and with markedly different tolerances for legal risk. Uh, we, still deal, we still do have other non-copyright challenges in online discovery, particularly with archival materials, a massive material that's at least an order of magnitude larger than monograph collections. These materials lack the structural uniformity of the printed book as well, making robotic scanning a much more difficult proposition. So here we still depend on humans processing collections and creating high level finding aids. Those finding aids can be web discoverable, of course, but item level searchability in the archives is not something I expect to see anytime soon. And as was the case in 2000, we still have paywalls in front of a great deal of scholarship. Though publishers have gotten good at making paywalled content available for indexing by search engine, that doesn't do the end user much good if she's not at a subscribing institution. Still, there are some hopeful signs here as more and more literature is either published open access or becomes open after an embargo period. Unsub is a great library-based tool for finding open access versions of paywalled scholarship, and it's not the only tool of its type. Perhaps at least as important to discovery as open access is open data about which more later. Annotation. In the symposium paper from 2000, I claimed that a third functional primitive is linking either in the classic form of annotation or the more abstract sense of creating operative associations within digital objects. The phrase operative associations was meant to cover not only actionable hypertext links, but also other kinds of pointers in SGML and XML the intricacies of which I had become acquainted with through early IATH projects like the Blake and the Rossetti archives, particularly the latter, which sought to capture a very complex multimedia genealogy of ideas realized in various visual and textual manifestations. The Rossetti archives strained the limits, not of the standards that it used, but of the software's implementation of those standards. So for example, having triumphantly imported 20,000 SGML files into a certain commercial SGML content management system that shall remain nameless so that we could more efficiently maintain and update those files and their parts, we found that checking out one file resulted in the software wanting to check out all other files referenced by that file or by files referenced by that files, which was of course all 20,000 files in the end. So in 2000, operative associations were not always easy to operate and regular old annotation in which you attach a note to something in particular was also not a thing you could do if the something in particular was anything more granular than a web page. Interestingly though, annotation was recognized more or less immediately in web development as a desirable feature, probably because of the research-based origins of both HTTP and HTML. Mosaic browser in 93 had a beta annotation feature that I played around with in the early days of IATH. Here's Mark Andreessen's explanation of how it worked. Every time you access a document in Mosaic, the group annotation server, if you're using one, is queried with the URL of the document you're viewing. If any group annotations exist for that document, 
the group annotation server returns to Mosaic corresponding hyperlinks, which are inlined into the document, just like personal annotations. Note the document, the annotations here were document level and the document was a web page. So if you went to Project Gutenberg and pulled up a 300 page novel, all your annotations would attach to the book as a whole, not to any page within it. That document level annotation worked better actually with images than with text. And IS first real success in implementing annotation was in the Blake archive with image annotation driven off of SGML markup and standard sizing and segmentation of Blake images. Uh, and the image annotation tool that we developed is uh, still in use today on the, in the Blake archive, although I'm sure there's not a line of code in common. Uh, there was another W3C project on annotation called Annotia, somewhat more advanced, that launched about a year after I gave the scholarly primitives paper at King's. Development on that stalled around 2005. Six years later, in 2011, Dan Whaley launched Hypothesis with $100,000 raised on Kickstarter. And his nonprofit has successfully built a multi-browser plugin that allows sentence level annotation on publicly available web pages and now also integrates with most learning management systems. It's the most complete realization of the W3C annotation standard and it builds on some Mellon funded work done at the University of Illinois Library and its School of Information in 2013 at the Center for Informatics Research and Science and Scholarship on the open annotation data model and specification. Perhaps not coincidentally, Dan Whaley is a graduate of the University of Illinois circa 1990 with a BA in English and a minor in photography. But I digress. I think annotation is one of the few scholarly primitives that I can really say is now supported by the open web. It's a mighty important one. In fact, the ambition of hypothesis is not only to allow the recording and sharing of annotations. Dan's most ambitious goal is for annotation at the level of the sentence or claim to provide a layer of peer review for everything on the World Wide Web. I don't know if it will achieve that, but it's already produced a very solid and usable browser add-on that allows creating and sharing annotations at the sentence level. And I do want to just stop for a moment to celebrate that accomplishment. I'll be using it in my graduate seminar on digital humanities this coming spring. At the opening of the talk, I suggested that comparison was perhaps the most primitive of scholarly primitives. In the 2000 paper, I said comparison is one of the most basic scholarly operations a functional primitive of humanities research. This perspective rose out of both the Blake and Rossetti projects, but found examples also uh, in Robert Kolker's work on Hitchcock, some of which uh, we published in Postmodern Culture when it was first being put on the web from IATH in 1994. You can look for an article called The Moving Image Reclaimed uh, from volume five, number one in 1994. Kolkler's piece offered what I think was the first comparative annotation of film clips on the web, showing the gaze of different characters uh, with clips available uh, as downloadable QuickTime or MPEG, MPEG-1 files. Uh, looking at the web today as an environment for scholarly comparison, I think it's not particularly good or particularly bad at this. Web browsers make it easy to do certain kinds of comparison between arbitrary web pages, something which we shouldn't take for granted. I mean, after all, tabs didn't become part of any major browser until Mozilla in 2002 incorporated the feature. And until Chrome in 2008, if a tab crashed, Um, but the web and its general purpose servers and browsers aren't meant to be adapted to a purpose as specific as comparison. On the other hand, at the information layer, semantic web advances, particularly in the area of linked open data, make the collation and comparison of semantically related data much more feasible than it once was. And big data does now make it easier to compare text across languages. Also image search is a thing that actually works now on the web and in the surveillance states that we all inhabit. So. Good news, bad news. Uh, in 2000, I claimed that for the purpose of scholarship, referring was a scholarly primitive, arguably more primitive, less decomposable than annotation, for example, since annotation requires reference to operate. In 2000, as today, the most widely used reference type on the web was the Uniform Resource Locator, or URL. But that year, 2000, also saw the introduction of the Digital Object Identifier. A DOI, as you know, is a unique string of numbers attached to a digital content object by a central agency, 
the International DOI Foundation, for example, or Crossref. Unlike URLs, which treat the location of an object as the first class entity, a DOI treats the object itself as the first class entity. When used on the web, the DOI still has to resolve though, so it has standard metadata associated with it, which can include a URL. In fact, used with open URL, a DOI can resolve to one of several locations, depending on the location of the user making their request or other factors. The publisher or other organization who registers the DOI is responsible for updating its location information should it change over time. And that ability to update location is what allows DOI to claim to be a persistent identifier. Uh, here at Daria, it should be noted that much of the work that produced the standards infrastructure to enable DOIs was done in the European Union. For example, the interoperability of data in e-commerce systems index framework funded under the European Community's Info 2000 initiative. Out of index comes the definition of metadata as, quote, a relationship that someone claims to exist between two reference or entities. In order for both ends of that relationship to resolve, there has to be sufficient precision, where sufficient is contextually determined, but ultimately sufficient also has to mean sufficiently unambiguous for machine resolution. From the point of view of scholarly primitives, Reference really is foundational. Scholarship itself is a matter of asserting relationships among objects or ideas of interest. And although not every scholarly assertion needs to be machine actionable, precision in reference is still important. DOIs and related reference schemes on the web today are driven by commercial publishing. And that means that the information privileged in that metadata scheme is mostly about intellectual property. While such metadata can be quite nuanced, this is a recorded instance of a 2020 performance by this person of a piece of music written in 2000 by that person, et cetera. It's not meant to express the depths of relevance and relation that would be of interest to scholars. For that, uh, we have the semantic web, which has its roots in the resource description framework, RDF adopted in 1999 as a W3C recommendation just before scholarly primitives and with its first implementation model appearing in 2004, a few years later. RDF was originally met as a, meant as a model of how metadata claims relationships between entities in the form of subject predicate object statements presented in a variety of serialization formats, like triples, JSON, LD, RDF, XML, et cetera. For RDF to be actionable in semantic web applications requires some agreement on the semantics of the relationship being described. And there are various controlled vocabularies that can be used for that, like Dublin Core, Ontologies of various sorts can be built on top of RDF, and it has applications beyond the web, but it puts us on the road to turning the entire web into a universe of assertions at levels from machine actionable to human debatable. And far from automating scholarship, it opens new horizons of debate about ontologies, about the bond boundaries of objects and the nature of relationships. That's good. Meanwhile, in projects like Australia's Trove, linked open data has already demonstrated its value in helping humans find interrelated bits of data in the ocean of the web and then do interesting things with them. Tim Sherratt, who oversees Trove, wrote in 2013, we tend to think about linked open data as a way of publishing, of pushing our data out, but in fact, the production and consumption of linked open data are closely entwined. The links in our data come from reusing identifiers and vocabularies that others have developed. The linked data cloud grows through a process of give and take by many small acts of creation and consumption. Another primitive mentioned in scholarly primitives is sampling, which in 2000 I described as closely related to selection. Sampling is the result of selection according to a criterion, really. The criterion could be a search term, in which case the sample that results from selection would be a sample of the frequency with which the thing searched for occurs in a body of material searched. In another case, the criterion might itself be a rate of frequency, for example, five frames per second, in which case the sample that results would be a series of images sampling the world inside the camera's frame every five seconds. But in the 20 years since I lofted this particular primitive, I think the most significant kind of sampling that we've seen in digital humanities scholarship has been statistical sampling in the form of text mining. And this is where we see the importance of those large troves of text that appeared in the first decade of our current century. The availability of text at enormous scale has driven a different kind of scholarship, one that proceeds through a combination of empiricism and estimation. Now, instead of arguing about the boundaries of literary genres or periods based on anecdotal evidence, we can argue based on different statistical models applied across billions of pages. 
for most of my own career, I've been working with others to build infrastructure like the Hathi Trust Research Center to, to support this kind of statistical analysis at scale. In other papers and venues, I've noted that the transformation of a discipline's primary information resources from analog to digital generally brings with it a transformation in method from observational to computational because of scale. In making this point, I often refer to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which launched in the year 2000 and used cutting edge camera technology to produce public data sets of information about astro astronomical objects. According to the SDSS website, the initial phase of work from 2000 to 2008, quote, resulted in a uniform, well calibrated map of the universe that will be used for decades in scientific studies ranging from asteroids to the large scale structure of the universe, unquote. I don't think literary text mining can yet claim to have produced a uniform, well-calibrated map of culture to guide literary studies in the future, but we are seeing more acceptance of these methods and more debate about them in general literary journals and no longer just in digital humanities journals. We have also now seen that the proliferation of these quantitative methods do not in fact put an end to interpretation or turn the keys of scholarship over to the computer. On the contrary, although text mining produces empirical evidence, there's always plenty of room to argue over how to interpret that evidence, over the biases and blind spots in the methods used to produce it, and over the absences in the textual record across which those methods operate. As I noted at the outset, the original paper mentioned illustrating as a scholarly primitive, but didn't get around to saying much about it. And it raised the related term representing with an oblique and probably confusing reference to deformation as a form of critical representation and tried to demonstrate that by warping an account of genetics research, replacing genomics with humanities throughout something that was meant to highlight the parallels between the traditional methods hitherto used by biologists and humanists versus the computational methods that were now needed by both to work with vast amounts of digital primary information. Having wandered off into this genomics tan tangent, my exploration of scholarly primitives abruptly ended. I'll try to do better here. I don't actually think that either illustration or, representative or representation is a very good candidate for a scholarly primitive, if the idea is that such primitives can't be further reduced to more basic components. According to Robert Williams's 2020 book from Oxford UP, The Metaphysics of Representation, that concept can be further decomposed as follows. The representational properties of language are reduced by a convention to the representational properties of thoughts. The representational properties of thoughts are reduced by our principles of rationalization to the representational properties of perception and intention. This most fundamental layer of representation is grounded in the functions these structures have to cause and be caused by events in the world. In a 2004 paper that I delivered at McMaster University called Forms of Attention, Digital Humanities Beyond Representation, I considered Frank Kermode's Wellick Library Lectures from 1985 published in book form under the title Forms of Attention, alongside the activities of the digital humanities some 20 years later. I argued that for as long as there has been humanities computing, humanities computing has been about the representation of primary source materials and about building tools that either help us create those representations or help us manipulate and analyze them. From there, I looked at the expressive limitations of the representation of data in early humanities computing. For example, the inability of punched cards to handle accented or non-Roman characters, or the serial form of storage provided by magnetic tape that made random access to stored data impossible. We've developed solutions to those problems over time, and we no longer experience the same acute sense of the inadequacy of our representations. But we would all still probably admit that every representation is an abstraction, and every abstraction is a reduction of some sort. But in terms of scholarly primitives, it feels more correct to say that representation is the whole game rather than just a move in it. We discover, sample, compare, refer, and annotate as part of representing what we perceive to be the object of our attention. And we try to persuade our readers to subscribe to our perception as well. So uh, coming to conclusion, as I said at the outset, I think the paper presented a reasonably useful, though hardly original idea. And I think my execution of that idea left something to be desired in terms of both credit and completion. So I appreciate the invitation to come back and patch up some of those deficiencies 20 years later in the company of friends. Looking back to 2000, 
It's really quite remarkable how much has changed. It gives one hope for the next 20 years, really. What's the next Google Books, the next linked open data, the next hypothesis? How many of the revolutionary ideas in the coming generation will arise in universities? And how many in the commercial sector? And how many from nonprofits? What are the limitations we'll run up against? I'm sure some, like human attention and its limitations, will be familiar. But we may also encounter others, like the appeal of falsehoods at scale in visual media, that are a new challenge for a community devoted to knowledge and, in as much as it is available in any generation, truth. In universities, we need to continue contributing to software and standards infrastructure for information that favors disambiguation, enables the declaration of sources and provenance, and ensures the stability of digital objects of reference, while also grappling with privacy, ensuring freedom of speech, and making us the owners of the information we produce by existing. That's all I have for you today. I'm happy to chat about any of that history or even better about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.